Hello, thank you for watching, listening this morning. I pray that the message you are about to hear will strengthen you in your faith. I pray it will encourage you in your walk with Jesus. If you have any questions that I could answer, please feel free to send me an email. My email is pepper at fbcmv.com. So now, enjoy the message this morning. Take your Bible and open it to Philippians chapter 2. Find verse 5, as you can see on the screen. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 is my text this morning. Now let me just take a few minutes because it has been two weeks, really three, since I preached to you. Let me take a few minutes and remind you of where we are and what I'm doing. I'm preaching a series of messages through the book of Philippians that I'm calling Recalculating. Because there are days, there are weeks, there are months, there are times in our life when we feel like that, that we're just on a detour. That what we had planned out did not pan out and, and, and God must have lost track of where we are. None of that is true. Paul had always had a desire to go to Rome and preach the gospel. And he desired to go there, stand in the city, stand in the streets, tell others about Jesus Christ. He wanted to go to Rome and preach. God sent him to Rome, not as a preacher, but as a prisoner. God sent him to Rome and he ended up in a jail. And out of that jail he wrote the book of Philippians. He also wrote Ephesians, he also wrote Colossians, he also wrote the little book of Philemon. And so there had to be a recalculation in Paul's life because what he wanted to do, he did not end up doing. The circumstances he found himself in were not those he thought he would find himself in. And so he had to recalculate some things. And I think that's what he's doing in the book of Philippians. The headline of chapter 1 is rely on a sovereign God. Paul had to realize that, you know, God's hand is still on my life. He hasn't left me. He is still working out his purposes in my life. That great verse there to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, which, which says, He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul knew that his life was still Although things had not worked out like he thought, his life was still in the hands of a sovereign God. And he had to rely on a sovereign God. The headline of chapter 2 is react in a Christ-like way. React in a Christ-like way. Because sometimes you see when we get put in a place we didn't expect to be or we get into circumstances that we never thought we would find ourselves in, we tend to react out of the flesh. We tend to react out of, out of our own selfish desires instead of reacting in a Christ-like way. And so that's where we are in the middle of chapter 2. The headline, again, being react in a Christ-like way to that unexpected event. Now, the last time I preached for you, we looked at these same verses, but we looked at them from the doctrinal perspective. The verses that I'm about to read to you are some of the best theological explanation of the person of Christ that we have in all the New Testament. These verses tell us very clearly that Christ has always existed, that He's not a created being. There's never been a time when Christ was not. That Christ is eternal God. He was manifested in the flesh. But He has always been fully God and fully man. And, G and God has exalted Him and given Him that name which is above every name, Lord. Now, we looked at it the last time I spoke to you from that perspective. And I, I preached a doctrinal message on the deity of Jesus Christ. This morning, I come back to the same passage of scripture to speak to you concerning the context in which Paul wrote it. What he wanted us to see in relation to how we react to a 
to an event that we never thought would happen in our life. How we react to the detour, the unexpected turn. We are to react in a Christ-like way. And that's why he begins verse 5 with these words. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now he's going to show us the attitude of Christ Jesus, which is to be in you and in me. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let's pray. Let's pray. And would you just simply pray for me? Please do so. Please pray and ask the Lord to speak through me today. Pray for yourself. Ask, ask the Lord to speak to you and teach you and show you what it is that you need today in your life. Let's pray for one another. Father, I thank you today for the opportunity to share your word. And I pray now, Father, that you would just speak through me and to us all today. And Father, I pray that you'll have your way, your will will be done in every heart, in every life. Some of us, Father, read these words today and will hear what you've laid on my heart to say and we'll be challenged by it, we'll be convicted by it, others will be comforted by it. And I pray, Father, that whatever work you need to do, you'll do in our hearts. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Listen to these words that are written by a dad. Many of us can probably relate to what this dad has said. Now you need to understand the kind of guy I am. I like my shoes spit shined rather than stepped on and scuffed up. I like my clothes hanging in the closet in an orderly and neat manner. Rather than drooled on and wrinkled up. And I really like milk in a glass on the table and not on the floor. I especially like a clean car with no fingerprints on the windows. And no leftover school assignments spread across the floorboards. So what does the Lord do to help broaden my horizons? Very simple. He gives me four busy kids. Who step on shoes, wrinkle clothes, spill milk, lick car windows, drop sticky candy on the carpet. You haven't lived until you've walked barefoot across the floor in the middle of the night and stomped down on one of those little Legos. I'll tell you, you learn real quick about your own level of selfishness so why why would the Lord have you in an unexpected place why would you plan out something and it never panned out why would you be on what you would call a detour in your life the same reason the Lord gave that dad children he wants to show you something about yourself he wants to show you something that needs to go from your life because it's not Christ like he wants to show you something that needs developed in your life or he wants to show you there is an action or an attitude that needs to change 
Because that's what the Lord is up to in your life. I reminded you a minute ago, I read it to you, that Philippians chapter 1 says, verse 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, you need to connect Philippians 1, 6 with Romans 8, 28, and 29. And you probably know that well. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed. Here it is. To be conformed to the image of His Son. That is what God is up to in your life. That's the good work that he began in you that he's committed, Philippians 1, 6, to completing. The good work that he's committed to completing in your life is to make you like Jesus. To conform you to the image of his son. He is making you attitude, action, heart, mind, soul, body like Jesus, and he is chipping away at you. He's chipping away at your heart. He's chipping away at your attitudes. He's chipping away at your actions until he has you thinking and behaving like Jesus. That's Philippians 2 5. Brothers and sisters, have this. Attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus. So here's my life point this morning. Here's where I want to begin. Here's what I want you to understand and take with you today. Let the detour produce the demeanor of Christ Jesus. And I put the word detour in parentheses because that's what you think it is. From your perspective, it's a detour. Pastor, I never thought I'd be in this circumstance. Pastor, I never thought this would happen to me. Pastor, I never thought what I... I just had something planned out and it, it, it never happened. I'm in a detour. Let the detour, parentheses, produce the demeanor of Christ Jesus. Because you think it, it's a detour, but in the mind and heart of God, it's not a detour at all. He has you right where He wants you. He's conforming you to the image of His Son. He's finishing what He started. He's completing what He started in your life. So Christ Jesus is to be our example as to what our attitude should be. Have this mindset. Approach your situation with a Jesus frame of mind. Think and act like Jesus. You say, tell me what that looks like, Paul, so I'll know. And Paul says, I'm glad you ask. And so he begins in verse 6. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Paul is going to show us three characteristics of a Christ-minded Life. He wants you to think and act like Jesus in the midst of your detour. And what I read a moment ago in verses 6 and the first part of verse 7 is the first one. Here's the first characteristic of a Christ-minded life. Choose people over position and power. Here's Jesus who existed in the form of God. Second person of the Godhead, possessing all the attributes of God, equal with God in every way. Yea, is by nature very God of very God, yet did not hold on to that position in heaven. Did not hold on to the power and the majesty that was his. But gave it up. He gave up his environment of glory. He gave up the insignia. The signage of his majesty. He gave up his right to remain in heaven. And took upon the limitations 
of time and space. For what? No, for who? You and me. Jesus chose people over position and power. Is that your demeanor? Is that your mindset? A demeanor that gives up position and places people first? A mindset that gives up power and puts others first? Grasping for power is as old as the temptation in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember the temptation in Genesis chapter 3? What was Satan's temptation to Adam and Eve? You'll be like God. You'll be like God. And so, as I read and reread that account this week in Genesis chapter 3, I saw something in it that I had never seen before. Satan's first temptation was to get you and me. Satan's first temptation was to get us to focus on what we lack. What we don't have. Genesis 3.3, and I don't think God wastes words. Genesis 3.3 says that the tree of life... The one they could not eat from, excuse me, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the one they could not eat from, was in the middle of the garden. That means they had to walk past all the other trees that they could eat from in order to get to the one that they could not eat from. They had to quit focusing on what had been given them and focus on their lack, what had not been given them. Because Satan is the God of lack. And Adam and Eve saw a position they didn't have. Adam and Eve saw a power that they didn't have. And they grabbed for it. And that same desire settles in my heart. Settles in your heart. I've got to grab some power. I've got to cling to my position. I've got to hold on to this title. I can't let them take this power away from me. But Christ-minded people live differently. Christ-minded people live with a different attitude. It's people first. Others first. Not my position. Not my power. I want you to watch a video that I came across this week. Just almost just by accident. I want you to watch and listen closely to a video that's two minutes long. This man's name is Simon Sinek. S-I-N-E-K. Maybe it's not pronounced Sinek. But but it's Simon Sinek. I I don't know much about him at all. He, He is an author. He is an inspirational speaker. He was born in England. He is now a United States citizen. He goes around and gives inspirational talks to businesses and corporations. He talks about leadership. That's about as much as I can gather. I don't know anything about his spiritual condition, his relationship to the Lord at all. But I want you to listen to him describe the kind of people who make it into the Navy SEALs. What kind of people make it as a Navy SEAL? The United States Navy SEALs are perhaps the most elite warriors in the world. And one of the SEALs was asked, who makes it through the selection process? Who is able to become a SEAL? And his answer was, I can't tell you the kind of person that becomes a SEAL. I can't tell you the kind of person that makes it through BUDS. But I can tell you the kind of people who don't become SEALs. He says the guys that show up with huge, bulging muscles, covered in tattoos, who want to prove to the world how tough they are, none of them make it through. He said the preening leaders who like to delegate all their responsibility and never do anything themselves, none of them make it through. He said the star college athletes 
who've never really been tested to the core of their being, none of them make it through. He says some of the guys that make it through are skinny and scrawny. He said some of the guys that make it through, you will see them shivering out of fear. He says, however, all the guys that make it through, when they find themselves physically spent, emotionally spent, when they have nothing left to give physically or emotionally, somehow, some way, they are able to find the energy to dig down deep inside themselves to find the energy to help the guy next to them. They become seals, he said. You want to be an elite warrior. It's not about how tough you are. It's not about how smart you are. It's not about how fast you are. If you want to be an elite warrior, you better get really, really good at helping the person to the left of you and helping the person to the right of you. Because that's how people advance in the world. Did you get that? Did you get that? You help the person on the left of you. You help the person on the right of you. That's how you make it to be a Navy SEAL. On a spiritual plane, that is exactly true. A warrior for Christ is not the person who is concerned about himself. Not the person who has all the spiritual muscles and, and, he's, and he's living for himself. No, the warrior for Christ is the person who deep down within, when he has spent everything he has, looks over to his left and looks over to his right and helps that person. What does it mean to have this attitude in ourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus? You give up power, you give up position, in order to lift up people. I've reached the age where I make a conscious decision every day to lift up people. All I want to do is encourage people. I, I used to not do this. I, I, I used to really, uh, I, I used to not do this. I, I, you know, sometimes a young man would bring a girl home that he was dating in college, and they'd come to church on Sunday morning, and he would introduce her to me, you know, Brother Pepper, this is Jill, and, and, or this is Mary or something. We, we're dating, and I'd look at her and go, why, why do you want to hang out with him? <laughs> now, now, I was joking. I, I, I was joking. I really was. Or, or I would make a comment like, well, man, you're hanging with a rough crowd of people today. I don't do that anymore. I just want to lift people up. Because life beats them down. Satan attacks them. People need encouragement. And Jesus is, is my example. The eternal Son of God became a man. He abandoned his rights for the sake of people he loved. And I want to do the same. Men, I wonder how our households would change. Men, I wonder how our marriages would change if we would do that for our wives. To abandon and give up power and position to lift up the people we love. I do so because I belong to Christ. Now let me take you back to verse 6 and 7 and 8 and let me show you the second characteristic taking the form of God verse 7 says excuse me taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross let the detour produce the demeanor of Christ Jesus here's the second one choose service over selfishness. I was listening to Charles Wendall preach recently. And, and he read this story. He's not talking about himself. He, he said the story was given to him by a friend. So when I start in a minute, don't, don't think Swindoll was talking about himself. But, but here, here's the story he told. I know I shouldn't have done this, but I'm 83 years old. 
And I was in the McDonald's drive through this morning. And the young lady behind me leaned on her horn and started mouthing something because I was taking too long to place my order. So when I got to the first window, I paid for her order along with my own. The cashier must have told her what I had done because as we moved up, she leaned out her window and waved to me and mouthed, Thank you. Obviously embarrassed that I had repaid her rudeness with kindness. When I got to the second window, I showed them both receipts and took her food too. Now she has to go back to the end of the line and start all over again. Don't blow your horn at old people. <laughs> now listen to me. That's not what we're going for. If I see you in front of me in the line of McDonald's, you better not do that. That is not choosing service over selfishness. But <laughs> seriously, as I read verses 7 and 8, there's, there's two phrases that jump out at me. Bond servant and humbled himself. Jesus didn't insist on having his own way. When you read the Gospels, you see that it is Jesus who serves others and not others who serve Jesus. Jesus did not strive for some pinnacle of human achievement. Instead, his whole life was characterized by self-surrender and self-renunciation and self-sacrifice. Jesus came to serve. That was his purpose. He humbled himself and went obediently to the cross. No one forced him to do so. One man writes, he humbled himself and even stooped to die. And then verse 8 says, even death on a cross. He didn't just die. He died by being crucified on a cross. And the significance of that is, is because in the first century, that was the most humiliating way to die. Being crucified by the Romans was reserved for robbers and assassins and the lowest of criminals. To be crucified meant you were cursed by God. Think about it. From the throne of God, from the being equal with God, from the highest of the highs, Jesus came all the way down to suffer the most despised death of all, to the lowest of low. Think about it. The oxygen, the soldiers who crucified Jesus breathed, he created. The wooden cross on which they hung him. He grew that tree. The hands that held the nails and swung the hammer. He formed those hands in their mother's womb. Jesus could have chosen to do none of it. But he chose to endure all of it. And you and I have been called to have the same attitude. Choosing sacrifice, choosing service over selfishness. I know, you. I, I do too, you get irritated. You get upset. You get agitated at God at times. You get agitated at others at times because I'm in this detour. You're in this detour. What, what you planned out didn't pan out. And so you're upset. And things didn't go your way. Someone didn't serve you. Nothing destroys your likeness to Christ like selfishness. Nothing destroys your likeness to Christ like self-seeking attitude. An attitude that is like Christ Jesus counts how many people you are serving. Not how many people are serving you. 
So if you're off on this detour, this unplanned event in your life, these circumstances that you never thought you would be in, if that's where you are, you need to recalculate. Yes, you do. Are you choosing people over position and power? Are are you choosing service and sacrifice over, over selfishness? There's one more. Hang with me. Let the detour produce the demeanor of Christ Jesus by trusting God rather than trying hard. Look at verses 9, 10, and 11. Therefore God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. After Jesus humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, God the Father took over and raised him up to the highest place in the universe. The word highly exalted there is a word that means super exalted. The most loftiest position that has ever existed. And that is the title Lord. Lord of those in heaven. Lord of those on earth. Lord of those under the earth. Lord of the angels in heaven and all the departed saints. Lord of the people still living on the earth. Lord of Satan and his demons and all the souls in hell. Every knee will bow and confess. Jesus is Lord. Now if God does that for Jesus, he will do that for you. Now here's what I mean. Don't think I'm fixing to step off into something heretical. If God will do that for Jesus, he will do that for you. Here's what I mean. Stop trying to manipulate yourself out of that spot that you never thought you would be in. Stop trying very hard to make the detour as short as possible. Stop trying to get your plans back on track and start trusting God to raise you up in His timing. Start trusting God to bring you back into a place where He wants you. And it starts by doing what these verses say to do. Confess Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I'll do anything you tell me to do. Jesus, I'm taking my hands off my life. Jesus, from this day forward, my circumstances, my situations are yours. I belong to you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to start trusting you and your way and stop trying to manipulate my way. Jeff Gravens, my friend who's the pastor at First Baptist Church in Sulphur Springs, wrote something this week that I totally agree with. Pastor Gravens said, we have reduced Christianity to clean living and church attendance. That's it. You live clean, you come to church, you've checked both boxes, that's all it means to be a Christian. We have reduced Christianity to clean living and church attendance. But it is so much more. Following Christ is an adventure. Here, when I was in college, here's how I had it explained to me. And, and, and I had forgotten it. And the Lord brought it back to my mind this, this week as I was working on the sermon. Someone said to me sometimes, that here's what you don't do. But we often do it all the time. We take a sheet of paper. And it's like our prayer list. We take a sheet of paper. And we put, our, we put, we put Lord, Lord at the top. We say, Lord, okay, here's what I would like for you to do in my life. And, and you begin to list things. And at whatever stage you're in, Lord, send me a great husband. Lord, give me a great job. Lord, I need a house. Lord, I need this boat. I, wh- whatever. You just make a list of things you want God to do for you. And then you sign your name at the bottom. And you take that sheet of paper. And you stick it up there to the Lord. And say, Lord, okay, you make it work. So much of us... 
that's what we do. I did that for a lot of years. Lord, Lord, here it is. Here it is. I've signed the bottom of it. You make it work. No, 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 no. Do you know what the Christian life is? It is a blank sheet of paper. And you sign the bottom of it. And you say, Lord, fill it in. Lord, you fill it in. Whatever it is, Lord. I'm following you. Whatever it is, I'm going to trust you. Lord, you fill it in because life with you is an adventure. Adventure. Well, thanks for hanging with me. You know, I was like the dog on the chain this morning. I'm sorry. I know. I know. So let me, let me give you like three take home. I, I, used, I said take home truths. I got that in my notes. But these are not truths. These are things to do. So I said let's do this. Let's do this. Pray. All of them are pray. Look at that. All of them are pray. Pray. Lord, make me like Jesus in every way. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. Lord, make me like Jesus in every way. Pray. Lord, send someone into my life this week who I can serve that could never repay me. You see, I'm I'm happy to do something for Jerry. I'm happy to go buy Jerry's lunch from time to time because I know Jerry's going to buy my lunch from time to time. That's easy. No. No. Lord, send somebody into my life this week that I can serve, meet their need, and there's no way in the world that they could ever repay me. But I'm going to do it anyway. And then thirdly, pray, Lord, forgive me for taking control of my life. I want to trust you. I want to trust you with my circumstances. I want to trust you with with the details of my life. I want to trust you with the detours that you have me on. I want to trust you with with, with those things that that I had planned out. But, Lord, it didn't happen. Lord, I want to trust you. So forgive me for trying to manipulate and take control of my life. Let me pray for us. Father. Father, thank you for your word this morning, for just the challenge to live with actions and attitude like like that of our Lord. And, and, And I pray, Father, that just in the quietness of this moment, that you'll speak to every heart here. Show them what it is they can do. In response to the message they've heard today. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Just a moment we'll stand. And maybe you need to come to the altar and just do some business with the Lord. You feel free to do that. You may need to just come pray. There may be somebody in the sanctuary you need to go pray with. If you're here and the Lord's led you to be a member of First Baptist, this is a moment you can join our church. You can come and just share with me. Your desire to be a member. If you're here and the Holy Spirit is drawing you today and he's saying you need to trust Christ. Just like our Sheriff Ricky did 45 years ago today. Walk down an aisle and give your life to Jesus. Do what this verse says that everyone's going to do either in this life Or five seconds after they die. And by then it will be too late to enjoy heaven. Confess Jesus is Lord. So you may need to come down an aisle and take my hand and say, Pastor, I'm here to give my life to Christ. 
So let's stand. I want to thank you for watching, listening to our service this morning. If you have a question about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, or if you desire to become a Christian, would you please send me an email? I want to help you. My email address is pepper at fbcmv.com. Or if you would like to know more information about the ministries here at First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, let me direct you to our website. Our website is fbcmv.com. And it is there that you will find a whole host of information about the ministries we have for your children, for your students, and for you as well. So the website address again is fbcmv.com. Again, thanks for listening today and may you have a blessed week. I hope you'll tune in again and watch next Sunday.